thing of faith in the future. I love the double play. And we are blessed um, in marriage to be two people who have deep abiding faith in God and who have particular gifts as we've begun to highlight um, today. And as, as sort of the structures of church have unfolded, we see our marriage as one that is an incarnate expression of the interconnection of formation and evangelism. We have particular jobs to do in the church that typically put me in what the church wants to say is the formation channel and typically put Tricia in what the church wants to call the evangelism channel. And we recognize they are one and the same. You cannot be a faithful evangelist without deep formation as a disciple. And if you have deep formation as a disciple, you can't help but want to go and be that witness she talked about in her sermon this morning. So that notion of showing up, of listening, of knowing the stories of our faith, of inheriting what it is that we believe in such a way that we then can point people to the traditions of our faith, Lutheran, Episcopal, Christian fundamentally, um, and say, this is good news. Jesus rose from the dead. And those, those scars that we were hearing about this morning in the children's sermon, that idea that we have wounds, that we can show our vulnerability to the world, we're not perfect. It is only God who's perfect, but we together have the promise that we will be made whole in Christ. So we live this, you're kind of coming into today a little bit of our breakfast table conversation. Um, and it's, it's pretty much this energetic every day. So you all um, in on your denominational website, there's this lovely phrase that says, living our baptismal covenant means living a life grow, <clears throat> excuse me, living a life of growth in the faith practices of discipleship. It's pretty straightforward, right? That we are grounded in baptism. We have a roadmap. We have a way of being in the world. And where my joy and my passion comes from as a person, and certainly as a person with a vocation in the wider church, is what, I, what she said, I think earlier, is activating baptism. There are so many good people who used to be in our physical churches, who may be in our Zoom or YouTube gatherings now, who are just kind of going along, being along, liking their local congregation, but who have no sense, from my perspective, of how radical and powerful their baptismal identity is. And as I have lived through the torment of these last years, this last year and a half of what COVID has exposed, um, what COVID has revealed about inequities in our world, I am more convinced than ever that there is no identity more essential than our baptismal identity. Each of us has a name, each of us has a family story, each of us has a racial, ethnic, economic, educational history and profile. Those are beautiful things and they're parts of who we are. But at the core, the thing that cannot be taken away from us is our baptismal identity. And can I just add something? Yeah. The world loves this idea. And you may say to yourself, people don't even like Christians. Um, you know, your uncle Buck who watches that news channel all the time, you know, he's a Christian and he's not part of the solution. Look, Star Wars, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, Harry, Harry Potter. Potter. Yeah, pick your narrative. All of them are based on the same idea. The Mandalorian. Think of um, Star Wars. There are people who know the force exists. And there are other people like uh, Han Solo who's heard of it, but he calls it, you know, hokey nonsense um, and, and like parlor games. Um, and other people have never heard of it. But the people who know that that is a power available to anyone they live kind of in two worlds. Does that make a sense that like, they live in the universe, but they know that the universe is itself full of the power of that thing. Go to Narnia, like kids that go through that wardrobe. When they come back, they're back in the London area in, in Finchley, right? I think mm -hmm. the, um, the suburb of London. But she looked at me because I grew up in London. So every so often geography gets caught there. Um, so, but once you've been to Narnia, they know even when they're back in Finchley that they, there is this, there is a kingdom that God created, a place of love where the Beatitudes is the description, mm -hmm. not the wish list 
Harry Potter, the people who know that there is a ministry of magic. Most muggles have no idea. Now that doesn't make wizards better than muggles. And, and that's even written into the story, that kind of um, bias and bigotry is like one of the main themes of the whole story. But don't you see, decade after decade, the last 50 years of the people who are going by the hundreds of millions to those stories because they love the idea that though you have a physical body, a presence in the physical world, that through baptism, this picture right now, this little kid, how adorable is this baby right here getting water splashed on them? You know what the face, look at that face. What he's saying is- How do you know it's a boy? I, 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 I it, there could be so many kinds of gender represented in this happy <laughs> child of God right here. Sorry. But the look on that face is, is there, a world through this wardrobe? Mm -hmm. Is there a force? Is there a ministry of magic? That face right there is saying, I didn't know. I thought my fingers and toes that that's all there was and food. So what we're saying that when we say your baptism identity, just to kind of ground that is, is, is just remind us, first of all, in culture, this is an assumption that this is a great story that everybody loves. But in the Christian faith, we say actually all those narratives, that's what C.S. Lewis told us, all those narratives, the reason why people love them is not because they're a surprise. The reason people love them is because they recognize something in them that feels possible, actually possible. So that's why I love the idea, like today, your baptism, if you look at your baptismal font in your church, think of that as the wardrobe in Narnia. That's what that is. It's the portal. It's the port key. It's how you get to see what reality actually is. Like when Dorothy, remember it's black and white and then everything is color? That's what baptism is. It doesn't erase the world. It shows you that you didn't even know. And then we walk through the world as people who know that there are muggles and wizards, who know that there is a force, who know that there is a Narnia. And like the characters say at the end of the Narnia stories, remember the ones who said, even if people destroy this Narnia, I will believe. I have seen it and you can't unsee it until the end of time, I will mean Aslan. What would you say? That was awesome. So Dottie had just said she wants us to come up and do more C.S. Lewis and Freud. So there you go. Um, so, Sorry, again. I just want to keep anchoring this in your tradition, right? So this, I, this baptismal identity, this comes also off your denominational website, right? The liturgy for the affirmation of baptism describes the faith practices that grow out of. Now, think about the sermon you just heard this morning. These steps are really the steps that Tricia was describing. This idea that we live among God's faithful people. We hear the word of God, which means we're listening for God at work in the world. We hear the word through the scriptures. We hear the word through the traditions of our particular Christian community that, with which we worship. And then we have something to proclaim. Then we have this good news to share. Then we know the story. Then we're on fire. And in the proclaiming, it's not all about words. We also live a witness of toward justice. We live a witness of caring and compassion and patience all of the spiritual gifts that allow us to serve people around us, people we know, people we don't know, people like us and people very different from us. And through doing that, we then become these people who recognize what vulnerability, what wounds, what hurt and injury looks like. We have known it. We share our own healing and we share the promises of God's capacity to heal and redeem the world. So justice can be known on earth. And so, all this work, all this identity that you already have, that's who you're called to be. Your faith in the future is rooted in the past. I'm not sort of a shiny new thing person. I love new stuff. I take it on. I use technologies. I am not afraid to try new things. But I actually, through COVID, am more convinced than ever that our capacity to change the world is rooted in who we are as the people of God and who we always have been. There's a wonderful phrase in, um, from Ghana that some of you have may, heard, may have heard that has been fairly popular among African-American communities and it's called Sankofa. And it's this idea that we have to reach back to our past, to our heritage and bring forward that which is eternal, that which sustains us for the sake of resilience in the presence and for the imagination and the future of what God would intend for us. And that notion of drawing from the past is what's going on here that I wanna share with you. 
So this is one of my current heroes, Catherine Meeks. Dr. Catherine Meeks is an Episcopalian. She's a um, lay person who is in Atlanta and who has taken an incredible lead around issues of racial and civic justice. But this, this quote from her, I think is really appropriate for all of us. She says, the baptismal covenant is not a document to be negotiated. She's a very clear person. She does not mince words. She says, it's okay if you don't want to follow it. She's fine with that. But maybe then you just need to go to a spa on Sunday morning. Go where you're going to be better served. A spa will make you feel good. A church will not. So as you think about your future and you think about the health of Upper Dublin, which is extraordinary. I felt it again this morning in worship with you. You have such health among your members and your generations, among your pastoral staff, with your musicians, you've got it going. It's beautiful. And nothing about that should be changed. I just have to tell you that last time I was worshiping with you at Upper Dublin, um, I was actually giving a big C.S. Oh, yeah. Lewis lecture at uh, a certain Episcopal church not far from you. I believe um, uh, they named it after uh, Doubting Thomas. I mean, it's um, St. <laughs> Thomas Church. And um, I woke up that morning in my hotel and I took an Uber to Upper um, Dublin um, Lutheran Church and spent the morning worshiping with you and then jumped in the Uber and rode back over to St. Thomas. They, I think they thought I worshiped there. I was like, no, no way. <laughs> but a good thing is I wasn't late for my lecture, but I came flying in um, on the, the wings of the spirit, the Holy Spirit that um, I experienced at, at your church. But shh, don't tell Thomas. Shh. So this is a model, and I'm not going to spend much time here, but I just, it's a very familiar faith development model for those of us who kind of hung out in the geeky side of church for a while. And the reason I'm showing it to you is more to affirm what you're already doing well. This is a model drawn based on some work by John Westerhoff, who was once a UCC pastor, became an Episcopal priest over the course of his career, and was a professor of Christian education for many, many years. He has a faith development system that he draws as the concentric circles from the center out. And it begins with something called experienced faith. And then it grows into affiliative faith. And then it gets to searching faith. And then it gets to owned faith. And ultimately we live into our fullness of being as followers of the way of Jesus. He took that, we, this model takes that model, takes that, that, faith development model, and lies it on its side, and then gives us this idea that we are all drawn to the heart of God. The idea here is that across the faith journey, across this lifelong journey as a disciple of Christ, we are moving by virtue of the Holy Spirit inviting us to come ever closer to the heart of God. We are moving from left to right in this model. It's not hierarchical. You're not better if you're further along. All of us need to experience faith in order to continue to grow in this way. But what's helpful about this model to me is that the reason it's a wedge is that at any given moment, if you took a, a, type, a test of time right now across the good people of your congregation, chances are more people will be toward the left end of this wedge than at the far end, because it's just where human beings are. We need to know we're safe. We need to know we're loved. We need to have basic needs met before we're ready to go deep into the work of faith development and faith journeying with God. It gets scarier. It gets harder to be a witness to the love of Christ the further we go into this role. So I show you this because when we experience faith, we just know God by being in relationship to other people. We know we are safe because our body is safe. We know we are experiencing love because we are being loved. We know we experience faith because there's plenty of food. We know that the sounds of music or the beauty of creation create some sense of awe, but we're not cognitively aware of what that is yet. As we move through this, and I can talk about this at great length at some other time, but we begin to notice other people who want to be with us, who are doing things in a way that means something to us. We begin to want to affiliate. You know my name. I know your name. I feel like I belong to something that matters. The stories I'm hearing from the pulpit, the lessons that are being read have a resonance for me. They begin to give make sense to me. I begin to want to affiliate with those stories. I begin to feel connected to them. 
And then for some of us at some points in time, and this happens repeatedly, it's not a one-off, it happens today, it may happen tomorrow, it may happen many times today. We hit a point, this aha point, where we start to ask harder questions. We start to say, I feel like I belong, but I have doubt. Or I feel like I, I don't understand why, if God loves people so much, there are people suffering. Why is this pandemic happening? We start to ask searching questions that take us deeper into the tradition. We wrestle with God. We search for meaning. We ask things of our community and of our neighbors and of our families and of our tradition that we might not have asked before, or at least not before this moment. And as we do that deep searching, we need mentors. We need people who will walk with us. We need this, the tradition to be sturdy and reliable and stable so that we can push against it and we can ask the questions and we can wrestle. And some of us, by grace of God and by our own good hard work, come to a place where we can own our faith. It doesn't mean that you believe every single word of the creed. It doesn't mean that you're absolutely sure about the virgin birth. It doesn't mean you necessarily know exactly what it means to be an angel or who an angel is or what happens after death, but you have a deep abiding sense of an own faith, a sense of belonging to the tradition and a readiness to witness to the love of God in Jesus Christ. Those are the folks who we pray claim core leadership in the life of our congregation. Everybody has gifts. Everybody along the way has a capacity to share their faith and to be helpful, to be a volunteer. You said you had a garden cleanup day yesterday. People could be anywhere on this wedge and love being together and particularly love being in fellowship, affiliating with one another, but may not be thinking about connections with God or may just be aware of God's wonderful creation. But some other people might be thinking more deeply about what are the pastoral needs of the person next to me? Who am I called to be to serve them in, in the next stages and places of our life together? So I share this with you because it describes for me really well a journey we're on together in community and that we are all called to be in relationship to each other, supporting one another as we find ourselves in any place along this wedge for a given period of time for a number of different reasons. So then, what that says to me and to us is that there is a tradition of doing church, which is often about going to church, the picture on the left, the going church, the being busy, the doing, as opposed to the being church, the growing church. We want to think about what does formation look like for this future, this ongoing growth of each disciple in Christ? so that it is more than going, it is growing. That each of you really knows that something about your faith life is stirring and stretching and becoming more real and more meaningful and giving you more of that superpower, more ability to go out in the world and be a witness of love in and against all of the principalities of evil that do exist. If you think about the gospel of Mark, remember Mark has 16 chapters. And the eighth chapter in Mark, exactly halfway through, that's where Jesus turns to Peter and, and to the, the followers, men and women, and asks the famous question of Mark 8, who do you say that I am? It's like a hinge. It's literally halfway through the gospel. So think of, of the, the Westerhoff graph that you just saw, that you have people who have experienced faith and then affiliated faith. And then there's the aha moment where all of a sudden they got a cancer diagnosis. And the experience of, of a Christmas Eve candle service that you love every single year and you don't want to change that experience of God just isn't enough. That has, it doesn't touch your heart. I mean, it's, it's July and you just found out that you have breast cancer. So that experience faith, which is so powerful in its own moment, in its own way, is not touching you with power right then. Or you're affiliated to faith. You've been in the women's spirituality group on Saturday mornings that go walking at a local park. You've done that for 17 years. But you know what? It's not Saturday morning right now. It's Wednesday when the doctor called you at work and told you that the biopsy came back with cancer. And whatever happens on Saturday is, it, it, it is important. It will be important going forward. But at that moment, you have things you want to say to God. You, you don't know what to say at all. And your welcoming faith, your experiences of faith, or your affiliate of faith has left you with, still with a lot of questions. That woman walking group does not explain why your granddaughter was just diagnosed as artistic. It does not answer that question. It may not even come near it. 
So similar in the first eight chapters of the gospel of Mark, the followers meet Jesus, they get called, they follow him, they see him doing things, they see the miracles, do you know what I mean? Like they start to see what this is about, but then Jesus stops and says, here's your aha moment. And in, our, in the gospel, it's literally halfway. And then he says, who do you say I am? And they're just like, we know you. What do you mean, who do you say? You're Jesus of Nazareth. We were there, remember? So that this picture, all those people who are on the left, they're just marching to church. They go every day. They go every week. Whatever they do, they go Wednesday nights. It's been 18 years, eight years, eight weeks, whatever. They're going to church. Something happens beautiful like this morning. And then they go home. And then they go back to church. <laughs> um, but what we're saying in that second picture is when a church like yours full of abundant life. The Lord still says to you right now, who do you say that I am? You've been around for the miracles. You've been around for the worship. You've been on the committees, but who do you say I am? Let's go deeper. They already could answer who Jesus was in the, in the beginning when they met him, but that hinge moment, that aha moment in the gospel is we think from what Keith is, Pastor Keith has told us right now, you're in one of those moments, mm -hmm. transition of leadership, coming out of COVID, going into the future, having a federal government that looks something like a democratic government again, mm -hmm. you know, we're, which means though, what, with that government, no matter what you think of it right now, there are still two African-Americans that have been killed in the last week by police officers, even though there's a president that maybe you voted for and you like. And a mass shooting so the work in never ends, but there is this moment where it looks like your particular congregation is willing to face Jesus, who they know, and answer again in a more deep way. Who do you, the, the, the Lutherans in Upper Dublin, who do you say that Jesus is? And in, in order to answer that, that's where we go deeper with questions and catechesis, and we move into that second part after the aha moment. And so what we're suggesting is that there are two kinds of formation that are already ongoing, both within your life of your congregation and beyond the walls and the community that you already are. And what we're going to suggest to you is that the more you pay attention to the relationship between these two forms, the healthier each of you will be in your growing discipleship. And I would argue the healthier your community will be as a growing dynamic community of Christ in the world. So what we are proposing is that there are these two forms, macro and micro formation. And macro formation is the ongoing life of the parish. It's that rhythm that is steady. It's the metronome. It's the being together. It's the knowing you can show up on Sunday morning at the same time and there will be good church, right? It's what we just talked about. It's this idea that we are drawn together around a tradition and sets of rhythms. Microformation, by contrast, are these intensive experiences, these things that happen to complement and to strengthen our faith in a very particular way. So microformation, macroformation is where you want to be paying attention to the steadiness, the ongoing metabolism of the life of your congregation. You do that really well. And I think you are spending time in discernment so, so thinking about what do we need to prune so that the stewardship of the gifts that we have is used faithfully. This is every, this is across the lifespan. So how do we do macro formation with children? How do we mac do macro formation with young people, young adults, with young families, with single people, with people who are living with disabilities, with people who are, who are slightly older, people in job tra transitions, all of the stages of life, right? How do we continue to love and form the people of God as a community so that we can be absolutely faithful to who we are called to be? An example would be like my mom went to an Episcopal church in Old Town, Alexandria, and went once a year, that particular church had like Grandparents Day, and it was a day that they brought in a speaker and, a, and like a barbershop quartet. It was obviously like, it was lovely, by the way, she loved it. But it was, it was, she called it this, it was like the annual old people's day at church. And it was this binge of like music they would like and food they would like um, and, um, and, and a good lecture. So there was teaching. People wore hats. It was old people's day. But her question when it was over is, I don't know that I want to join this church because I don't think they have old people church. I just think they have an old people day. It's like youth Sunday. And it was wonderful. She really, really loved it. But for the rest of the year, there was not, it's not like this was one of that, that let's say that the church prayed to commit that once a month, they would feed the heart, mind, soul, and stomach of people over 65. And this was a great day among them. That's not what they did. 
they had what we would call random acts of formation. Um, and it's not that it isn't great. And some churches are really good at it because they have the money. Like St. Thomas, let's be honest, that Episcopal church up the street, for a while, they have money to throw at a speaker. They fly in from London and do they this great talk about some weird thing in the fifth century and poetry. Okay, um, that's what we call a random act of formation. That's not macro formation. That's not why I left St. Thomas and went to worship at Upper Dublin. The reason I did is because I knew no matter who, even Lisa was like, is Keith preaching? I was like, don't we know enough about that church to know? I don't know who's preaching and I don't know what the music is. But I already know because I know the pastor that they have a, a culture of excellent macro formation. It doesn't mean there aren't days that don't go well, but it means the general metabolism is the preaching is going to be good. Will it be the best I've ever heard? It might be, but it might not be. But it's not going to be below par ever. The music may not speak to me, but it's not going to be thoughtless, careless, um, unprofessional music. What about professionals? That's to say it's not mindful. So you all have what Lisa's saying already, because I've experienced it, that you're very good at creating a metabolism where people can say, doesn't matter what Sunday or what Wednesday night or what Saturday morning, there's going to be a commitment to mindful worship and discipleship. Mm -hmm. So you need that, right? So that's like the baseline and then the micro. So again, you have some examples of this already, but um, what we want to help you think about is where can you grow and expand beyond like those tent poles of the stable Christian formation program, right? You know what Sunday school is, you know what perhaps vacation Bible school is, you know what an adult forum is, here we are. Um, what can you add to that? The women's retreat yesterday might be a really good example of this, an intentional burst of deepening relationships and formation for a particular group of people, right? Young people going to summer camp, if, if it's a healthy Christian camp, is probably one of the most immersive experiences and formative experiences young people can have. Young people or older people going on a pilgrimage, uh, people being involved in a very intentional service project in the community that is not just the work of service, but is the prayerful discernment and study about how we're called to be the people of God in service. What, what is it about our tradition and our baptismal covenant that is actually sending us out to do this work? And how are we going to sustain relationships beyond the actual day? But it's the deepening intensity, the focus when you, in a sense, lose track of time, when you're doing something so well and so deeply that you sort of forget what day it is. You forget that you're hungry. You just do the thing, right? Um, think about ways that your particular communities, your subcultures within the congregation, might need to be deepened in their faith. And what are the ways, this may mean partnering with other congregations. This may mean doing something at a denominational level. This may mean doing something in, as an interfaith experience that calls you to attend to your Christian identity. But the key here is not macro stability and then micro bursts. It's micro bursts that are informed by the macro rhythm. So if you are sending young people to camp, be intentional about how you prepare them and send them from the life of the congregation. And then be intentional about how you receive them back and listen to them and hear their stories or watch their video clips or talk about the art craft projects. Be sure that what happened in those micro places is embedded back and, in, and blesses the life of the ongoing rhythm of the congregation. So let's say that, you, that once a month, you have a young person give a, a two minute testimony to God in their life. I'm just making this up, but, because I've seen churches like this. So that's part of their macro formation, which is every month it's someone and they've been doing it, I don't know, two, three years. So everyone knows that that's what's gonna happen on the first Sunday of the month or whatever. Then you have this amazing, you send your kids to your local judicatory, whatever you all do as Lutherans, summer camp for a week. But then, and which is amazing, and you have like six kids that have that amazing experience or an internship or something. Then you plug them in as people who will be the speakers in that. So do you see how they work together? A church that just has young people asked to speak once a month, but doesn't give them any intensive bursts, you know, sort of something to say, then it just falls on students to come up with their own things that they want to share that they're not being really formed in intentionally. So to just have the macro is, is good. I mean, it's always good to hear from young people, but without giving them these, these, these micro experiences that let them have bursts to talk about. 
and growth with God. They took a new risk. They did something and they have something to talk about. Likewise, if your parish is just full of one-offs that all of a sudden you send these eight kids out and when they come back that, that weekend after, all they want to do is talk about Haiti or Standing Rock Reservation, right? Or Appalachia. And you have no ongoing rhythm of hearing the voice of teenagers. So Satan loves churches that do one or the other. Macro without micro puts people to sleep. So I'm going to hurry up because I want them to talk. Um, so here's the here's the picture we really want you to think about. Um, this blending of the two, macro without, right, is this thing that we can just get comfortable. We can sort of get stuck and we like it. That's the thing. Those of us who are active in churches, and I mean this right in church broadly, online right now, it, I recognize we're not physically doing church the way we once did, and it will never be that way again. It's always going to be hybrid, but it can still get normal. We can normalize it for those of us who are already within it, right? Micro is this mountaintop experience, and we've all seen it. Maybe we've had that experience. We keep using the youth summer camp example, but it's a good one. I know so many young adults who, when I spend time with them, tell me that their church is summer camp. Their church is the experience of having been a camper and then a counselor, that that's where they find God. And I get it. I so understand it. But that means the, the whole church has failed them. We have not found a way to bring that extraordinary, extravagant experience of being alive in Christ into the everyday normal of their life at home or in school or at work. And we, that's a shame on us. The ancient model that did this well was the catechumenate, the idea that every congregation, every faith community has a rhythm, an ongoing rhythm of discipleship that is always accompanying people from the very first moment where they wonder about the mystery that is God because something in them is stirring, where they are, where they are asked, what do you seek? All the way through an intentional process of formation to baptism, typically at the Easter vigil, into the baptized life, into vocations and callings that are the Christian life. The macro with the micro together is a church like yours that has an ecology, like it just has an ecology of believing that we are called to grow as disciples from birth to grave and that we are not going to give up on that vision and that dream. And finally, macro with micro is this rhythm that isn't just in the church. That's the whole idea. It's not just we're a lovely parish who love each other and we do really good church online together, whatever that is. It's actually, how do I function when I go to work on Monday morning? How do I function in my marriage? How do I function in my extended family? How do I witness to the love of God because I am being formed, because I am growing as a disciple? How do I treat people in the grocery store when they cut me off in line? How do I actually behave when I'm tired and I'm really at my worst do I still have a reserve that remembers that I am beloved, that I am forgiven, and that out of that gratitude, out of that transformed identity, I am called to love others in Christ's name? I mean, would you, if, if, you, if I went to a zoning meeting in Upper Dublin um, about dog parks or parking, or imagine if, if someone stood up and spoke in a way that talked about social justice, that talked about community involvement and being getting to know neighbors and um, imagine if someone leaned over and said, I bet they go to that Lutheran church. They just sound like someone who, who went, goes to that church. And if someone says, have you ever been? They're like, no, I haven't been, but one of them is on the PTA. And another one is, is, is uh, one of the guys that does the, the, um, the Boy Scout mulch drive. Um, you, trust me, if you met these people, you'd know what I'm talking about. Like they're just kind of hung up on justice and loving people and um, you know, that kind of thing. So that, that's what we mean by like, that, that, that it's not just church. It's that once you yourself are experiencing that growth and you have spurts and then you have a, a community in which the spurts then get digested into making the whole year a richer experience for everyone. So you're sharing, you're being a witness, not just mm -hmm. to the world, but being a witness within the congregation mm -hmm. to how you're growing. And, and people of all different generations are sharing with each other in rhythms mm -hmm. of sharing and reflection what God is doing in their life. So while that's going on, then when those people are encountered by the people outside yeah. in the community, that's how you know you're getting it right when someone says, you know, or if you're a jerk in public, wouldn't it be great if at least if someone said, well, the one thing, I, they probably don't go to that Lutheran church. Like if you met some jerk in the PTA, they probably didn't go to that. Okay, folks, we've talked at you. 
I saw some, yes, of course you can have the slides, Olivia, not a problem at all, happy to share them. Um, we just wanted to kind of give you some, I try to name some things that relate to your life already. You have strengths to build on. We spend a lot of time in congregations that are not healthy. We spend a lot of time trying to help people be inspired for what's next. Um, you got it. How can we help you? Questions, thoughts, reactions. Dottie, 